So as you guys know, we've been in a series and we've been looking at the men and women of the Bible of as they lived it. We've been in that, that area where we're, we've been looking at men of the Bible and a couple ladies. But realistically, we've been looking at these guys that have great faith. We've seen Abraham go out and leave his family. We've seen Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen Moses. And Moses is just a guy that we all can look at and go, wow, just an amazing man. But yet, with every amazing man, there's another side of the story. And today, we get to look at a man that is known by one word. His name is Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a special man in the Bible because as I said that word, Pharaoh, most of us have an idea of who he is because he's the ruler of Egypt. And we're specifically going to be looking at the Pharaoh of the Bible, the Pharaoh that was alive during the time of Exodus. He's a man that doesn't need a lot of introduction, but yet he's a man that we can struggle with because we can look at him and go, well, why did you do that? Why didn't you let God's people go? How could you? And we also look at him in a very unique way because there's a, a phrase in the Bible that says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's actually usually something that we all struggle with. It's, it's something that if you ever go out and, and talk to people about the Bible or you watch the History Channel and you're like, man, this is going to be good, it's all about the Exodus. They're going to spend 30 minutes on that phrase. What does it mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? And we're going to see that today. We're going to see not only God hardening his heart, but we're going to see Pharaoh harden his heart himself. And also, we might learn something. And that is, we might see what the greatest argument is to not follow Jesus. Because in all the Bible, Pharaoh uses some of the most effective arguments against Moses. And we get to see that today. But to start off, we need to go back a little bit and kind of learn who Pharaoh is. And Pharaoh is a man that we've seen right at the beginning of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 1, we see this king of Egypt. And in Exodus 1 verse 8, this is speaking of him. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This is an important thing for us to see because right from the beginning, God sets up something that we all understand. There's a man out there that doesn't understand or know who God is. There's a lot of people that don't know who God is. There's a lot of people that we run into in our daily lives and they're like, who's the God of the Bible? Who is that person? Who is the God that you worship? This is what Pharaoh is. He needed no knowledge. He had no knowledge. He didn't need it of who God really is. And because of that, that actually shapes the world. That shapes how he views the children of Israel. That actually shapes how he views his home. That's how he views his nation. He doesn't view it in light of God. He views it in light of no God, which is very fitting for today, isn't it? Because we sit out there and we go, man, if I don't need God, if God doesn't exist, how would I behave? And we usually sit there and go, oh, it's going to be so nice and great. No, you know how we behave? Very selfishly. And that's how Pharaoh starts off. Because Pharaoh looks around and goes, I like having slaves, except for, you know, they're getting a little bit too many people. So how about I go all Thanos on them and kill all the babies to stop the population? That was his actual response. So we see this, this Pharaoh guy, and to stop the population, he decides to kill the children of Israel. And that brings us to a very sad question, which is how in the world could God let a leader like Pharaoh be in power? You know, it's funny to me because usually I get this a lot as pastors. When, when someone doesn't like the government, they usually come up to me and say, how could God let so-and-so be elected? 
And I go, I don't know. <laughs> but he allowed Pharaoh to be the ruler. In fact, God actually talks about his selection process. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, We've all heard this. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and that the authority that exists are appointed by God. Which should make us all scratch our heads and go, why? Why Pharaoh? Why this man that was evil, this man that killed babies, this man that just had obstruction after obstruction in front of the children of Israel. Why would God allow him to be king? And the answer is because he's God. I know that's a, a really bad answer and not one that's very satisfying, but the truth is that we look at Pharaoh and Pharaoh is in power and God is going to use Pharaoh in his disbelief. And that's what we're going to see. So over this next Bible study, we are going to be skipping all over Exodus. We're actually going to be looking from Exodus chapter 5 to Exodus chapter 12. And I promise I'm not reading it all. <laughs> we are only going to be looking at some of Pharaoh. So we will be skipping things like the plagues. We won't go over all of them. We won't go over the frogs and all those things. We'll see some of them. We'll see in light of them, and we'll see Pharaoh's response from them. So we're going to be skipping around, and we're going to start right here in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now, we need to, to kind of pause there because we know that this is after, you know, God showed himself to Moses and Moses had the snake stick and the leopardous hand. And he goes and he says, hey, go to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh. This is the first encounter that Moses and Pharaoh were together. And the first thing Pharaoh hears is, let my people go. Thus says the God of Israel which means nothing to you if you don't believe in the God of Israel. It's very similar to me walking up to you and saying, let my people go according to the force of Star Wars. <laughs> you might have an idea of what the force of Star Wars is, but realistically for Pharaoh, he's hearing this going, why are you saying this to me? And God is actually introducing himself to Pharaoh in a very kind manner. He's coming to Pharaoh and saying, I want you to let my people go so that they can have a feast in the wilderness. Now, we also need to see that the first request from Moses was that they hold a feast. He didn't say anything about leaving the land. He didn't say anything about, oh, by the way, you're going to pay me with silver and gold and jewels and, you know, all those great things when we leave. No, he started with, Hey, can we go into the wilderness? And Pharaoh responds. And it says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. He sits there and says, No. It's a very simple no, right? He's like, Why in the world would I actually answer this? And this is where it gets hard for us. Because as believers, and I'm sure as Moses was there, he's going, I have the, the God card. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, let my people go. And God's going to do an amazing miracle. He's just going to change their hearts immediately. We need to know something. Does God do that? We'll see. Not all the time. The truth is God doesn't change our hearts. He doesn't force us to follow him, does he? Anyone being forced to follow God? No. So why would he do it to Pharaoh? Isn't it amazing our prayers usually go that way? God, can you just change them so they follow you? <laughs> Wait, hold on. That's not really how it works. God's introducing himself to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is at this time going, all right, why should I obey? And Moses gives a little bit of a response of going, because they're God's people. And Pharaoh looks at him and says, no. 
That's going to be a very common answer. He looks at him and says, no, but then he does something that's great, and it seems really harsh. We're going to skip ahead just a few verses in verse 6. This is Pharaoh's response after saying no. Because usually when you make someone mad, it's not just no, go away. It's no, and I'm going to punish you. And that's what he does. It says, so the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw themselves and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it for they are idle. Therefore, they cry out saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and let them not regard false words. Pharaoh's response is, so you want to go out, that means you're lazy. Did you know if you have a day off, you're lazy, according to Pharaoh? You know, weird, does that sound like anyone's boss? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here Pharaoh is, he's like, you're asking for this day off. And no, instead, I'm going to not say just say no, I'm going to make your life absolutely miserable because now you have double the amount of work. You get to go out to the fields, get the straw, and then bring it back. And this is his quick response. He's sitting there going, yeah, this is going to be good. This will squash them quickly. Now, there's a problem with that. See, Pharaoh is sitting here, and he's responding in a very human, very fleshly way. But there's still a God that he doesn't know. And that's always a scary thing. When you have God there that actually knows everything and has a plan, and you don't know it, it's like playing poker when the other person knows your cards. And that's what Pharaoh's doing. And this is going on, and as this is happening, the children of Israel come to Moses, and they're like, what the heck? Come on. You come here, you're going to let us go, and all of a sudden, no, you make our lives more miserable. I'm sure Moses was sitting there just depressed. So God comes and speaks to Moses. Right here in chapter 5, if we skip ahead a, a little bit more, in verse 22, it says, So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I, have, I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither you delivered your people at all. Don't you love Moses? You haven't done it, God. Don't we always like to do that to God? We sit there and we're like, God, you said this was going to be easy. Where are you? Where are you? Why? Why are people getting mad at me for being a believer? Why doesn't the world know who you are? You know, I'm sure Moses might have even in his head go, if you could appear to Moses, or if you could appear to Pharaoh in a burning bush, it might be really cool. Because Pharaoh would listen to you, right? But God is sitting there, and Moses is, is, is blaming God, saying that you haven't done this, and yet God responds in, in chapter 6, verse 1, and says, then the Lord said to Moses, now notice the grace in this. Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Isn't that a gorgeous beautiful, amazing verse, unless you're Moses. Because you're sitting there and you're going, okay, God, you're going to win. But really think about what God said. He's going to drive you out. Have you ever been driven out of a place? You know, when they put on the song Closing Time and you're like, you have to get out of here now. I don't care where you go. You are leaving. This happens. I'm going to tell you, it's not fun to be driven out of somewhere. It's not enjoyable to sit there and go, yeah, I was driven out by force. <laughs> now, I have some personal experience with this. When I was a police officer, I drove out people from the Capitol. They didn't look like they were having a good time. <laughs> I'm not sure I was having a good time. 
But this is a real life thing. And God's like, I'm going to drive them out. That means a forced march out of Israel or out of Egypt. And yet this is a great thing because during this time with Pharaoh, this ungodly man, we're going to also see how Moses is learning from God. We're going to see how Moses is sitting there going, okay, so I get to trust you. I get to actually believe in you. I get to see what you're going to do. Because it's an amazing thing that Moses at this time actually takes hold of what God is going to say to him. This is the time when Moses is done complaining to God and he starts to change his tune. And we see his tune change in Exodus chapter 14. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert if you don't know the rest of the story. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, it says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. The part that I want us to really focus on is him say, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Isn't that what God is telling Moses to do right here? Just wait, don't worry, God is going to do something amazing. And he's sitting here and he's going, he's going, all right, God, what do I do next? And We see Moses and Pharaoh now have this weird interaction between each other because Moses gets to be God's spokesperson. This is a fun place for us because usually we get to be the spokesperson for God to the world. God called us ambassadors to him. And Moses does just what we do. Just as we want to go on, he's like, all right, I have an idea. God, you've given me some ability. And he does this in chapter 7, verse 8. Right here he goes again and he wants to speak to Pharaoh again. And it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you, uh, saying, show a miracle for yourself that you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. Don't you love right here? He comes in and Pharaoh looks at Moses and says, hey, prove, prove it. Prove God is real. How many of us have been asked to prove God is real? Well, if God's so great, can you prove it to me? And God even gave Pharaoh or gave Moses a stick that turned into a snake it's kind of a cool thing because this is something that Moses had. And I'm sure Moses was sitting there going, yes, it's going to be awesome. Pharaoh is going to believe right away. And that happens to us because we'll go in and we have a great argument for God. And we'll sit there and we might even put our life on display and say, I was this and God changed me to this. And we're showing this miracle and we're like, They cannot deny this in any way. Now, the truth is, we say they cannot deny this, but can they? Can they actually say, meh, I'm not really going to believe because there's always an excuse. Because right here in verse 10, it says, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did, just, they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, uh, b- before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called his wise men and the sorcerers, so the ma- ma- magicians of Egypt. They also did like in like manner with their enchantment. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents." But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. We see what what happens here. They go in and they throw down the snake stick. And Moses is like, da-da! And Pharaoh's like, watch this, ta-da! You know, that always strikes me as funny. Because... We can sit here and go, wait, how did they actually change their rods into snakes? Isn't this a miracle by God? 
But we sit there and we actually start to see how God works and how God interacts with us and how God has a, a unique plan with the world. And that is oftentimes our response to, hey, this is where God is. Let, him sh- let me show you a miracle. Let him show you my life. The response might be, well, you know, I found inner peace with Buddhism. And you sit there and go, well, how do I argue that? How do I actually come and say, well, you're wrong? And we can sit there and go, man, my argument is completely gone. And as that that happens, we can get discouraged. But the truth is, we can also wait just like Aaron did. And his snake swallowed up the other ones. But as this is happening, there's a man named Pharaoh. And in verse 13, it says, And Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Now, I want us to focus in on this because this is an important words that God uses here. Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Do you notice that none of this actually says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart? This is a choice by Pharaoh at this point. Pharaoh is sitting there and he's like, "Uh, you know, I'm not going to believe in your God and your snake stick. I'm just going to, nope, I'm not going to heed it. And his heart grew harder and harder and harder. So what's Moses going to do? Well, God told him way back when, you know, he was talking to him and he said, hey, if they don't believe you, I'm going to turn water into blood. Maybe I should try that. So right here, it continues on and says, so Pharaoh said to Moses, or so the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. And when he goes out to the water, you shall stand by the river banks to meet him with your rod and you shall turn, and you shall, which it was turned to a serpent, and you shall take it in your hand. And, when, and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Now, we bring this story to a place where they're going and going and going, and God is now changing what he's saying to to Pharaoh on purpose. Before it was, I just want to go out into the wilderness and have a feast. Now it's, you go out to the wilderness and serve me completely. And they do it in front of the riverbanks. And as they do it in front of the river riverbanks, it says, Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water, the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. Whew, isn't that gross? Here God is, and he's like, All right, I'm going to show you something new. I'm going to go to the river and I'm in front of Pharaoh and I'm going to strike it down and it becomes blood. Now, what's Pharaoh going to do at this place? What's Pharaoh going to do when he sees the Nile River turn to blood? Have any of you guys ever seen this happen? I mean, no one has ever seen this. This is a really cool event. And we would think in in Pharaoh's mind of going, well, of course they would listen to God. Of course he would turn to God. The river just turned to blood. And all the fish died. And all the the people are going to start to go hungry because the river now stinks, as it says in verse 18. And the Egyptians loathe to drink the water. I love that fact. It says right here that they loathe to drink this water. And Pharaoh is standing there watching. But God continues and continues and continues to harden his heart. He sits there, or Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. God doesn't do it at this time. Pharaoh's continuing to, to, to harden his own heart because it says in verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. So the Egyptians did it, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them. So they turned. And as they're turning there, and as they're sitting there, their heart, his heart is growing so hard that he's not even noticing God. 
Now, how is God going to get Pharaoh's attention? This is usually the question that we're asked so many times because we'll sit there and we'll go, all right, God, this person over here is not grasping who you are. We might have someone in our lives like that. And you've seen their life get worse and worse and worse, and now it smells. And you walk in, and you're like, how's your life going? And they're like, smelly. Don't you wish people talk like that? Man, it just really stinks. Oh, wait, they do. (laughs) They sit there, and they'll complain, and they'll go, man, this is just horrible. How in the world is this going on? All these things. And you're going, well, there's a God that can help you. And... They're like, nah. And you're sitting there going, how can you not believe in God? How can you not actually turn to the Lord? And this is where Pharaoh is at. And as he's at, his heart is turning to absolute rock and it's in pain. But yet he sits there. And God's not done. This is a scary warning to us all. If we don't turn to God... He keeps going. It's really scary. So we're going to skip to the third plague, which is in chapter 8, verse 16. If you're keeping track, they are on the screen, hopefully. Right? And it says right here in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 16, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Could you imagine the calls home from school? So all the kids have lice. Why? Because all the dust turned to lice. This is fun. This is a, this is a rough disease. So, or this is a rough uh, plague that God puts on them. So he, God says this to him, and he continues on in verse 17 and says, And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on the men and the beasts, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout the land. So here it is. Now, Pharaoh usually goes and says, okay, what you can do, the world can do better. So he tries. He says, now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. Isn't that amazing? You can't bring forth life unless, you know, you're God. Which is a fun Bible fact trivia. If anyone says, how many things did God create out of the dust? It's two. Man and lice. (laughs) That's special. (laughs) Just want you guys to know that. Here they are. So they're looking at it and going, I can't do this. It doesn't become lice. They could not do it. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the the best part. This is when your friend, the friend of the person that's still of the world, looks at him and says, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. Isn't that scary? He looks at him and said, and the magicians look at him. Their friends go, hey, guess what? That must be God because I can't do that. And Pharaoh's like, nah. His land just turned to lice. There's blood in the water. There's all these horrible things going on. And his heart is just sitting there going, whatever. His heart grew hard, and it gets worse for him. As his heart grew, grew, grows hard, there's a fourth plague that comes on, and it's frogs this time, or flies this time. We're not yet to the frogs. It's flies. So now you have lice and flies. How many of you guys love flies in your house? How many of you guys have the little salt gun that you shoot them with? We want flies gone. So flies are everywhere. It's an absolute uh, horrible time. The plague begins, and right as this plague happens, we start to see Pharaoh do something. In verse 25, it says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. Oh, isn't that beautiful? How many of you guys know there's ten plagues? We're on four. It sounds so right. 
He sits there and he calls Moses right there and he says, why don't you guys go and sacrifice to the Lord? Isn't that beautiful? And then Moses asks the question. And Moses said in verse 26, it is not right to do so. For if we would be sacrificing the, to the Lord our God, it would be a sacrifice of the Egyptians before their eyes. Then er, it will not be good for us. We will go three, uh, three day journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commanded us. So Moses continues on. And he's like, okay, Pharaoh, you want us to go, but here's the rule. We're really going to go for three days now. So Pharaoh said in verse 28, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall, go, shall not go very far, intercede for me. Isn't that a great response? He looks at, at Moses and says, all right, I get the whole God thing. I get it. Maybe he's real. So what I want you to do is I want you to just go just a little bit far and have a three-day feast. And can you pray for me? Please. Oh, it's just going to be so nice if you pray for me out there. Realistically, what Pharaoh is saying at this moment, is he's actually looking at Moses and saying, hey, I want you to go and just be you, and I'll be me, and you worship your God, and I will pretend he doesn't exist, just don't have him attack me anymore. Doesn't that sound familiar? We can all coexist. <laughs> that's really what Moses, that's really what Pharaoh is saying. Hey, we can co, we can live together in peace and unity, and it'll be good. Okay, and I'm sure that Moses was sitting there going, yeah, this sounds so good. I'm going to pray for you even. We can have joint prayer. But then Moses said, indeed, I'm going out from you, and I will... Entreat the Lord that the swarms of fly may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from all the people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in letting the people of go to sacrifice the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did according to the words of Moses. He removed the swarm of flies from Pharaoh, from the servants, and from his people. Not one remained. That is an amazing prayer. Because have you ever seen flies? You kill one, three more come. They're gone. But here's the sad verse in verse 33. When it says, But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Pharaoh straight up lied. He sits there, and he's like, all right, we can't coexist because, oh, I'm going to try to do this, and I'm going to tell you it's all good, but as soon as it's not good for me, it's not going to work for you either. Isn't that selfish? Isn't that a place that usually we are as believers? We sit there and go, yes, I've gained an inch, but as soon as it's not good and as soon as it's, it's, it's good for the other person, they throw us away, they throw a believer away, and he's hurt. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And this continues on and on and on. And we get to skip ahead a few plagues. Because in plague six, boils come which, by the way, is painful, and no one wants to have. And it says right here in verse 12, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them just as the Lord has spoken to Moses. 
So now, during the time to, to, to catch us up, we've seen that the livestock are diseased, and now boils have came, and Pharaoh is sitting there going, please stop this, please stop this. And yet, at the same time, he's looking at it going, but I don't want to follow the Lord. I don't want to turn to the Lord. And now, after six plagues, God puts in the words, he hardened his heart. Now, what does this mean? This is the first time in the Bible that you'll see that God hardened someone's heart. But I'm going to tell you that this is something that is actually common to us today. Is that shocking to anyone? It's it's something that, that God actually does for us. Because during that point, could Pharaoh have turned to God at any moment? Here he is. He's going, yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening. I'm trying to to get along, but my heart is hard. I can turn to God. Now he's looking at it going, oh, this is getting really bad because my boils are itchy. And God's going, do you really believe me? And God knows his heart. You have to remember, God knows his heart. So God hardens his heart. Now, the word is better described. He strengthened his resolve. Doesn't that sound wonderful? He made him immovable. By the way, an immovable object generally doesn't move. He strengthened him at this moment. But this is after many chances. In fact, we see this happening today in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, we see God say this. And it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, just like Pharaoh... God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. God will allow us to go down the rabbit hole if we don't turn to his knowledge. And that's what's happening to Pharaoh. He's sitting there and it's going bad. It's going so rough for him. And as he's there, God's strengthening his resolve and he still will not let the children of Israel go. And then another plague comes. And it's one that we all know very well. Hell. How many of you guys got damaged in a hell storm in the last, you know, five years? Like five times, right? It's bad. So hell comes, and Pharaoh looks at the hell and goes, okay, ice balls from the sky, not good. I have an idea. Let's stop that one. Maybe this Moses guy can stop it. So as hell's coming down from heaven, and just imagine the scene. It's coming down from heaven. It's going all around him. He calls Moses in verse 27, and and Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people are wicked. Ah, finally. Isn't this a beautiful statement? I have sinned. How many of us would look at Pharaoh right now and go, you're right there. You're almost one of us. But there's an interesting problem with that. Remember, God knew his heart. He's sitting there saying, I have sinned, I have sinned. And then he's saying, hey, go out and pray to God and stop this hell, please. It's an amazing thing. When we're in trouble, we like to pray. Everyone does. It's a famous saying that there's no atheist in a foxhole. But they might leave an atheist after they leave the foxhole. You see, Pharaoh is praying to God, saying, I have sinned. Please stop this. And as soon as this happens, it stops. And in verse 34, and when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hell, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart. Now notice who hardened his heart at this time? Pharaoh did. Pharaoh turned and said, I have sinned. He understood. But then he turned immediately back and said, I have hardened my heart. He and his servants. So the, the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord spoke to Moses. He changes back almost 
immediately. This is the eighth plague, or the seventh plague. It's going, it's getting harder and harder and harder for him. And then the next plague of locusts comes. The hell is gone. The food that's remaining is now being eaten by locusts. Everything is going poorly for him. And even though it's going poorly, he's still sitting there going, you know, I can outsmart this God. And he gives them the second option, which, by the way, I will tell you, is the most effective option the world can give us. And that is found in chapter 10, verse 8. And he says, so Moses and Aaron uh, were brought again to Pharaoh. Which, By the way, the fact that he didn't kill Moses and Aaron is a miracle, right? <laughs> and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God, with, uh, who are the ones that are going. And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds we will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. And he said to them, the Lord had better be with you where, when I let you, let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. Isn't that a beautiful? Oh, now he has a big heart. He's sitting there. He looks at him and says, Moses says, okay, we're going to go, and we're taking everything with us. And he looks at him and says, well, what about the children? This is my favorite argument. Because it works. We will sit there and follow God. We'll sit there and follow God. And as we follow God, we're crazy. Just so you know, we are crazy to do it, according to the world. And as we're crazy, they'll sit there and first go, yeah, we can, we can coexist. We can get along. It's going to be good. That doesn't work. And the next thing that they say is, what about your kids? Don't you know how bad it's going to be out there for them? Don't you know it's going to... Can't they choose for themselves if they want to go? Have you ever asked a two-year-old if they want to go somewhere? <laughs> Does that work for anyone? No, two-year-olds often need to be told what they're doing because they're like, where am I going? I don't want to. I want to sit here and play with the lice dirt. That's what's happening for him. So they're hanging out, and, and he's like, no, we're taking our children with us. And Pharaoh's like, oh, those evil ones. Now, this is a very real thing, and I'll tell you that this is an argument that was used to me many times. When I went out there to first plant a church, I even remember family members coming to me and going, well, what about your kids? What about my kids? What, what about them? Like, how does, you know, me changing my job really affect the lives of my kids except for, oh, wait, everything. But here's what I will say once again. Is it more important for your kids that they have a, the same life or they see you follow the Lord? But yet this argument works so many times. And as he says, hey, what about these kids? Moses says, no, we are taking our kids. And yet Pharaoh says, no. You're not leaving. And God says, oh, by the way, they are. I'm going to give you another really cool plague called darkness. Isn't that a foreshadowing thing? Pharaoh is sitting in darkness now. And as he's sitting in darkness, he calls Moses again. And he says, go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let the little ones also go with you. Pharaoh changes his mind and says, just get out and you can take your kids too. Just keep your flock here, please. This is the third argument that Pharaoh gives. And I love this argument also because this one gets to us a little bit also. Hey, go serve God, but what about your money? What about your things? 
did you know that the Christian church, they pass this bag around and they ask you for money? You have to pay to be there. <laughs> That's really what Pharaoh is saying. <laughs> hey, leave back your flocks. It's going to be better to cheat a little bit. It's going to be better to do this. And Pharaoh is, is saying this to, to Moses, but Moses looks at him and says, you must also give a sacrifice, a burnt offering, that we may sacrifice it to the Lord. I love this. Because Moses looks at Pharaoh and says, yeah, you say, leave us back. But by the way, we have to sacrifice to God, meaning we have to give this to God. We have to give this right to him. And as this is happening, Pharaoh his heart is still hard. Because we see in verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Now, I would suggest the reason the God, that God hardened his heart was because Pharaoh wasn't giving to God everything. He wasn't actually saying, God, let the people go, let them go, let them go, and have this. No, he was sitting there saying, yeah, you can have the me and you can have my kids, but leave my stuff alone. That's good. That's good Christianity, except for it's not. Pharaoh is asking them to do something that's wrong, and they're not actually fulfilling God's promise. So God hardens Pharaoh's heart here. And he brings forth the last plague. This is the green fog that you've seen in Charleston Heston movies. How many of you guys think the angel of the Lord is green fog? It's straight from Ghostbusters. <laughs> so he comes in, and, he go, and Moses goes to Pharaoh and is like, hey, by the way, now since you won't give us anything, I'm going to take away your first kid because God's going to kill the firstborn of the family. And we see this instructions, and we see... All these things happen. We see that, that God comes in and he says, hey, we're going to do this, but there's a way out. And we see a beautiful picture of Jesus here. We see the fact that, that as they sacrifice the lamb, the lamb is sacrificed and they put blood on their doorposts and they, they mark their house. And Pharaoh looks at them like they're nuts. He says, you crazy crazy God followers. You see, this happens so many times. We follow God, we're warned, or, and others are warned, and we try to warn back, and we look, and it's like, hey, you're a crazy Christian, until the angel of the Lord appears. And the sacrifice that Christ had, the sacrifice that Pharaoh was allowed to take part in, he refused. His own son died. And there wasn't a house in all of Egypt that was without death. That's a scary, scary night. Except for those crazy people that put blood on their door frames that actually took part in what God was doing. And as this is happening, we see Pharaoh, when he refused to listen to God, refused to put the blood on his doorpost, we see what he says to Moses. Remember the promise of God. Right here in verse 31. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you, your children of Israel, and you shall serve the Lord as you have said. Also, take your flocks and your herds, and you, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead which is a true statement. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having, needed, er, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they asked the Egyptians for articles of silver, articles of glow, gold, and clothing. And the Lord gave 
the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. This is the last plague. This isn't the last time we're going to see Pharaoh. This is the last plague. And the response was by the Egyptians, what was it? Get them out of here in haste or leave as fast as you can and I will pay you for it. Think about that. Pharaoh was finally at a point where he broke. Pharaoh was finally at a point where he said, you know, I'm going to follow the Lord, my God. Actually, the Lord, God of Israel, not his God. I'm going to follow him and let them do their thing. Now, the truth is, Pharaoh never repented. See, he lived the plagues. He lived the destruction from the other side. And it was all because he didn't know who the God of Israel was. He didn't know who the Joseph was. He forgot God. Usually we can look at him and say, man, what an evil guy. I actually look at this story uh, with much grace. Because the truth is that God gave him 10 opportunities to turn to him. He gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to say, hey, actually do this because the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was all on his own. He was the one that hardened his heart at the beginning and yet he refused to, all because he didn't have the knowledge of God but yet there was the children of Israel as well. And this is where this story gets even cooler. This is where we can take hold so much of what God does for us, our struggles, our plagues, because you have to remember that the children of Israel experienced the plagues as well. When the water got smelly, it was smelly. When their livestock died, they died. When the frogs came in, they had frogs. This was their life. But yet, as this all happened, they were at a place that they got to see the Lord move. Sometimes, when we have a leader that doesn't follow God, when we have a, a friend, a family member, a coworker that doesn't follow God, and we're seeing this destruction happen in front of them, it can also strengthen us. And we can sit there and say, I know the God that lives. And that gives us the ability and the desire to follow in with the people of God in this praise. In Psalm 100, it says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. All because we know the Lord our God. And we see the difference in Pharaoh, a man that refused the knowledge of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you don't give up on us. I thank you that even in times where we see struggles, even in times where we see you, the pain of not living with you, or the pain in even others' lives, Lord, that we can look at you and say, I know who you are, and I know your salvation. 
Lord, I ask right now that if we are sitting here and we're going, I, I need more knowledge of you. I want to enter into your gates of thanksgiving. I want to follow you. I don't want to have a hard heart anymore, Lord. Lord, I ask that if that's us, if we're sitting there going, I don't believe in this God. I didn't believe in this God. I don't know who you are, but yet you're coming forward and revealing yourself. I just ask that we can just pray after you, Lord, and say, Lord God, I have sinned. I'm a man, a woman that doesn't know who you are, Lord. But I ask that you just come in and that I can get to know you, that I can follow you, that I can serve you, all because of the blood of your son and the fact he rose again. In Jesus' name, amen.